Awesome. Good morning, Harvest. Welcome, everybody, to um, Harvest Fresno. My name is Carlos Guzman, and whether you're here with us in person or joining us online, we are so glad that you've decided to worship with us today. Um, we have our friendship registers at the end of each uh, pew there, so if you're here in service with us, um, or in person, I should say, uh, go ahead and fill those out. And it's also an opportunity for you to share any prayer requests that you may have there towards the bottom of the friendship register. And also, if it's a confidential request, you can go ahead and mark private or confidential there, and then only the elders of the church uh, will be praying over that for you. If you're visiting us for the first time or you haven't checked in with us, we'd love for you uh, to send us a text. Let us know you're here, and also you can, you'll receive a special introduction to Harvest Fresno. You can text the word WELCOME to 559-245-6200. So again, welcome to 559-245-6200. And after service today, we have another Harvest Fresno potluck for everyone to enjoy. Uh, so even if you haven't RSVP'd, we would love, love to get to know you, to, to uh, connect after service. Uh, so please uh, stay by and join us. There's always plenty of food, lots of fun and laughter, and plenty of fellowship. Um, we're going to ha be having a Christmas Eve service here uh, at the church at uh, at 2.30 p.m., and that'll be on December 24th. So Christmas Eve service, that makes sense, right? December 24th. At 2.30 p.m., though, so please note the time. Uh, join us for the service and then plan to hang out for some cookies and cocoa. And if you can bring cookies to that event, uh, they don't have to be homemade. Uh, you can let Jackie Cromwell know, uh, so she'd like to hear from you. And then our Christmas calendar, you ha you'd have to check out our weekly email and social media to get all of our Christmas activities on your calendar. There's a lot of things still planned and coming up, uh, so make sure that you get onto our email. And I was really excited about this announcement. Spring Small Groups Church. Spring Small Groups are going to be starting the week of January 16th, so they'll be back. Uh, this spring, we're going to begin a 12-week journey through the book of Philippians, uh, copies of the Bible study books and signups are going to be available to you after services starting in January. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and the books will be $6. So looking forward to our spring small groups. And if you have any questions about these announcements or if you want to be part of our weekly email, you'll get these announcements and other information there. All you have to do is email church at harvestfresno.org. So email church at harvestfresno.org to get added to our email list or if you have any questions again about any of the announcements today. So today, church, we remember uh, the love that Christ has laid out for us with his own life. Uh, we also remember his great gift to us, which started with him coming to earth in the form of a baby, right, during Christmas time. So as we think about this great gift, uh, we do give back to him with our own offering so whether you're online, uh, there's a way to give online. If you're here in person and you'd like to give, we do have a, an offering box there uh, at the uh, back of the, of the sanctuary. So um, just let us uh, take this moment to, to pray to God, thanking him for uh, the offering and for this service. Father in heaven, we thank you so very, very much, God. You are so gracious, so kind to us, um, Lord, and we just... We give this, we put this service in your hand, uh, in your hands, God. We pray over the offering that uh, will be received today, and we just ask, Lord, that it would be used to, to further your kingdom, for your glory, uh, and the good of the church, God. Um, we pray just a blessing over our pastor as he has prepared uh, a message, God, that you have put in his heart to share uh, with not only him, but your people, Lord. Uh, so again, we just pray uh, just that you would touch us that you would be with us, God, and that you would reveal yourself to us more and more uh, so that we might um, just know you better, my God. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, name above every name, amen and amen. All right. So before I let you go, I want you all to take a moment to greet one another and just say hello. Glad that you are here while our children come up. We're going to get ready for our Christmas program with our children. So go ahead and take a moment just to say hey.
We are back. Now, thank you very much for joining us for our children's Christmas program. It's one of the highlights of the year for many of us. Um, the children have been working uh, hard at learning these songs. So it's kind of going to be like a night of carols. We're going to do three. We're going to start with the song, O Come, All Ye Faithful. So go ahead, get your cameras out, and uh, click away. And if you want to sing with them, that's cool. But are you all ready? O Come, All Ye Faithful, nice and loud. Here we go. That was a, uh, yeah, there we go. Here we go. Let's hear it for our children. I got to listen to this every single week as we were practicing, and it warms my heart every single time more and more. So the next song we're going to sing for you all is Away in a Manger, nice and loud. Can we hear them back in the back there? Okay, nice. So Away in a Manger. You ready?
And for our last song, we're going to sing Born is the King, It's Christmas Time. So this one does. You don't need the words. Does anybody need it? It's all in the memory. Anybody want the words to It's Christmas Time? Raise your hand. All right. Hold on. One second. There we go. They're ready. You're here. All right. Hold on. Rewind. There we go. Nice and loud. Take a bow, take a bow. And then we're going to walk. Start going this way. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Excerpts from Isaiah 7, 10 through 16, and Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, quote, A sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or, or high as heaven, quote. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped, quote. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel, quote. God wants us to know, even when we aren't sure ourselves. God wants us to experience his presence, even when we think we can handle life on our own. God sends us signs of his presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. 
he took her as his wife, but no, had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and named him Jesus. We light these candles, the candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today of presence that speaks of love, as a sign that no matter our circumstance, we know we are not alone. dark shadows put to fight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to a sinner with haste to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Hey! 
tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood Please be seated, and welcome, church. So good to be here on, on this uh, little chilly for us uh, morning, but uh, what, a, what a warm place to be in is, uh, is the church, is the body of Christ, isn't it? And um, for those kids, uh, the cuteness factor is off the charts with them, isn't it? You just, <laughs> just close in prayer and just... <laughs> Call it a day. Yeah, so cute. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we could be here this morning, uh, just uh, being with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, joining together uh, in, our, in our hearts, in our, in our spirit, to worship the one uh, true God. Uh, we are so grateful for this great privilege and know that uh, it's only because of you, um, by sending your beloved son into this world that, uh, that we could have eternal life and, and have life abundantly now and that we could come and, and worship you. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, you would move me out of the way, uh, that uh, I would truly decrease and you would increase and that your son would be highly exalted this morning. I pray that the uh, proclamation of the word would uh, penetrate our hearts uh, accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit to do what we can never do on our own, and that is uh, to be conformed into the image of your um, beloved Son. In his precious name we pray this, amen. So today uh, was a planned Advent message, and of course you saw the theme was love. And I don't know if you recall, if you were here last week, we ended on um, the scripture of John 3.15. And so it wasn't planned this way, but God in his uh, providence and sovereignty uh, had uh, it arranged this way so that we have landed on John 3.16, which of course is uh, one of the most well-known scriptures uh, that describe God's love. In fact, it's probably the most recognized scripture in the entire Bible. If someone has memorized any bit of the Bible, it is usually John 3.16. Um, it is a favorite scripture of many, many people. It's uh, for God so loved the world that he uh, gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And our kids, when they memorize it, said everlasting life. Now, Luther called it the heart of the Bible. It's, uh, he called it uh, the gospel in miniature because it just represents uh, the entire gospel in very few words. In fact, it's been described as an ocean of thought in a drop of language. But it is ubiquitous. You could find John 3.16 almost everywhere. If you, have, uh, you may even have uh, something like this, a framed picture in your, in your home. Um, that is uh, often, you could see that in, 
in many Christians' homes, or, or perhaps uh, in the morning you have a coffee mug with uh, John 3.16. You could see it at uh, many sporting events and even on the street. Here's a man. <coughs> you may have seen him before. John 3.16 shirt. It's uh, at um, baseball games, football games. You'll see the sign, John 3.16. And, of course, uh, Tim Tebow uh, made it pretty popular when he put it under his uh, eyes. And <clears throat> it can be found on shoes. And, of course, you go to In-N-Out, you turn over the, the cup, and what do you find? John 3.16. So, this is one of the most popular scriptures, but as R.C. Sproul says, it's one of the most distorted scriptures. Many people think they know what it means, but that is not necessarily the true meaning of John 3.16. In fact, it's used most often uh, with the emphasis on whosoever shall believe, and it's often used as an invitation to believe in Christ. Anyone who wants to accept Christ can be saved, and that's how it's usually communicated. But that, again, is not typically what, or that's not what it really says. So we are going to uh, take a look at this in, in greater detail. And, uh, of course, the setting will help. So let's uh, have some context. You remember where, where we are here. Jesus was communicating with Nicodemus. And with Nicodemus, he said that you have to be born again. Unless you're born again, John 3.3, 3, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. So the requirement for eternal life was that you have to be born again. And then you see in John 3.8, it says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is everyone born of the Spirit. This is emphasizing the, the sovereignty of God in how someone gets saved. And then you have, right before this, in John 3, 14 and 15, it says, And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so that must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So it's focusing on trusting and putting your faith in Jesus. And this is where John 3, 16 comes in. It just says that whoever believes in him will have eternal life if and when the Son is lifted up. So, it's a familiar passage, but let's take a look. I'm going to do something that I typically don't do. I'm going to show you kind of a little bit behind the scenes of what this looks like in the Greek. And I know it's just, um, I just want you to have a big picture idea. Okay. John 3.16, one of the most beautiful verses and well-known verses in the Bible. For God loved the world in this way. And uh, hutos can, can be translated so, in this way, thusly, thus, right? And many people are used to hearing it translated so and understand it to communicate intensity, like so much. God loved the world so much, and God does love the world so much. But hutos, it is true, more frequently means in this way and, and seems to be pointing forward to this host of clause. And very few English translations want to mess with people's memorization of John 3.16. But the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB, does translate it this way. For God loved the world in this way, you know, dot, dot, colon, right? That's what the host is giving that. How, how did he love the world? Well, he gave, edokin, right? That's the aorist form of didomi. He gave the unique son, the one and only son, right? An imp implied idea of uh, relationship, his one and only son. And there is some debate here about monogamy too. Should, be should this be translated only begotten or unique or one of a kind? So he gave his one and only son or he gave his only begotten son so that, eh, eh, expecting the subjunctive, we actually have two subjunctives. Here's a lengthened vowel. Here's a lengthened vowel. We're going to have two subjunctive forms there. So that, Everyone who believes in him, that is everyone who believes in the Son, would not perish, right? Notice how the subjunctive is negated with may, would not perish, but would have eternal life. 
being a general invitation to believe in the Lord. It's really a declaration demonstrating the love of God and how God loves sinners. And so we're going to take a look at characteristics of God's love from this passage. And the first characteristic that we're going to look at is the source of love is God. It's pretty evident, but here it is. For God so loved the world. The source is the personal yet infinite God. God of the universe. God's love is greater than any human love, obviously, of any man or any person. God loves you more in a moment than any person can love you in a lifetime. If you think of the greatest object of your love, however much you love that person, your spouse, that child, your mother, your father, that love is limited. That, that love has boundaries. That love is imperfect. And that love will fail. It will diminish. It will change. But for God, there is no limitations. His love is infinite. It is boundless. The psalmist declared in Psalm 103.11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love of the Lord uh, towards uh, those who fear him. As C.S. Lewis says, uh, God's love is not wearied by our sins. It is a relentless determination to save at whatever cost. One minister remarked, when Mary and Martha sent for Jesus because Lazarus was sick, right, and dying. It was not that they said that, uh, Lord, he who loves you is sick. That's not what they said. What they say? Lord, the one whom you love is sick. It is God who loves. In the writing of John, it's revealed that God is love. We're told very few times who God is in terms of his essence. We're, we're told in John 4, 24 that God is spirit. We're also told that God is light. We're told that God is a consuming fire in Hebrews 12, 29. But also, over and over again, we are told that God is love. God is love. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Whenever he loves uh, uh, Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. John, 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And 1 John 4.19, just a few verses later, we love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. We would never love him had he not first loved us. He's the source of love. The story of an emperor loved a peasant girl, and it would be absolutely unthinkable to think that the love, that relationship was initiated by the peasant girl. She would never attempt to love a sovereign king or emperor. That love came down from above upon that peasant girl. And the thing that we see here is for God so love the world, or love the world in this way. So what does love mean? It's a, it's a verb that is a past completed action that stretches from eternity past and goes all the way into eternity future. It's an expression, it's a love that finds its expression on the cross of Calvary. And when we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we see, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. And it says in this, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. In love. We were chosen by him. That was the motivating factor. That he first loved us. That he chose us. The source is love. So what does that, that mean for, for you and I? 
Well, it means that our relation with God, our relationship with God, is not dependent on, all, on us, on our imperfect love. It is dependent on God's perfect love, on his infinite love. And that gives us a sense of security in our relationship with God because it is an infinite God with infinite love for you that maintains the relationship, that secures your relationship, that, that makes it certain that you will enter into glory because the source of love is God. And secondly, it is unconditional love. It is unconditional love. For God, in this way, loved the world. The world. Now the world, even in the book of John and in First uh, John, his epistle, it is used in many different ways, including in the different ways in the Bible. Cosmos. It is used to, to describe the entire uh, universe as a whole. In Acts chapter 17, God made the world and all things in it, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. So it's this idea of just this physical, uh, the, the universe, the created universe. But it also just is used of the earth itself in Ephesians 1.4. When uh, Jesus knew that his hour had come so that he would uh, depart out of this world and to the Father. Out of this world is this globe, this earth, and he's going to go to the Father in heaven. It's often used in John as an evil fallen system. It is in first, excuse me, John chapter 12 where it describes, now this is the judgment of the world, that the world is judged, that the prince of the world is cast out. So he, Jesus even talks about the same, being the ruler of the world. It's a fallen world. And it's also used in the entire human race. It's just described uh, all, all people. In Romans 3.19, the whole world is, is guilty before God. And it's also talked about believers. That the world of believers. And uh, it says, if the world hates you, that um, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So here we're talking about the uh, humanity, fallen people, less believers. And so, how do we define the world here? For God so loved the world. Now, there's different views on this, but I think it's pretty clear. It's the fallen race, including Gentiles. So, it's typically, God came to save the Jews. That's what was well known. And that's what was believed at the time. But here he's saying that God so loved the world. All the fallen people from every tribe and every nation, were, regardless, that is who God ultimately came to save. And so it's all of fallen humanity without any distinction. And here in John chapter 7, it says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. So he's talking about a, a fallen world. And so... He said that he, he says that he loved the world. Now, what type of love is it? L love is used in different ways in the Bible, too. There's storge love, which is love for a family. There's phileo love, which is uh, brotherly love or affection. Uh, there's eros, which is uh, erotic or, or romantic love. It's, um, it's not used. Uh, and agape love. And that is that sacrificial love. It's loving someone without any expectation of anything in return. It's for the benefit of the other person. That's the love that is being used here. So how does God love the world? How does God love his fallen, uh, fallen humanity? Well, there's a love for the world that's, that's general. It, it's found in common grace. It's found that people are born, they live their lives, and they don't perish immediately. In Psalm 145, 9, it says, The Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. His mercy is found in throughout creation. In Matthew 5, 45, it says, He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That is God's common grace. That is a love for humanity. 
But there's also in the Bible a special love, an effectual love, a saving love, which is different than that general love. It's a, it's a specific love for people. And we find that special love, that redeeming love, that electing love, that overcomes any rebellion or resistance towards him. That's the type of love that we're talking about. And it, we see that very clearly in God's first love for Israel. In Deuteronomy ta- chapter 7, verse 7, describing Israel, it says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping his oath that he swore with your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. So here's this special love, this redeeming love, this electing love that he had for Israel. Of all the people in the world, he only revealed himself in this way to Israel. He chose Israel, again, not because there was anything that that Israel merited. It wasn't that they warranted God's love. He just put his love on them. He set his love on them. There was nothing Israel did, again, to warrant it. He selected them. There wasn't a negotiation. There wasn't anything like that. It was just sovereign, unconditional love that he set on Israel. And so he considered them his treasured, a possession. And God loves you in the same way. That there is absolutely nothing that you have done, or I have done, or could do that warrants God's love for us. It is unconditional. We didn't earn it. Think of the story of Hosea, where God told Hosea to marry a harlot go on. She was going to be unfaithful and continue to be unfaithful. And God told told Hosea, no, pursue her. Be relentless in your love for her. And that was a picture of God's love for Israel. That Israel was unfaithful and God was relentless in his love to pursue Israel. Israel, regardless of how unfaithful Israel had been. And that is to show that the love wasn't conditional on on how lovely Gomer was. She was unlovely, unlovable. And Hosea set his love upon her. And so when you think about it from a human perspective, most of the time when we say that we love a person, Say, I love you. The, the subcontext is, you make me happy. You're benefiting me. And because you're doing that, I love you so much. What are we really saying? You, you see this in, uh, in marital counseling a lot. Why do you want to be married? Oh, he or she fulfills me. It makes me complete. Well, this person makes me happy. It's all about you. That, that's our human love. That we love, basically it's saying, we love ourselves so much. That if you're willing to do something that benefits me, then, <laughs> oh boy, I love you. But if you don't, guess what? Don't love you as much. Right? That's how it works. But God's love is so different. It is so different. What are we? He he loves us. Not be, you know, he it's not like he loves us to pieces because we're so adorable and we're so lovable, and why wouldn't he love us? Right? Why wouldn't he love me? That's not what it looks like. Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God. All have turned aside and together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. That's us. 
And that's who God loves. There's nothing inherent in us that makes us lovable. In fact, it's the exact opposite. There's only that in us which makes us repulsive to God. But Romans 5 eight. but God shows his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in that state. Fully knowing our sin far more than we know our sin ourselves, God loves you. Overcomes the rebellion, overcomes the whatever sin that exists in us to relentlessly pursue us and love us. In fact, we were never able to love him. It's not going to be an ability. Ephesians 1, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 2 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you've been saved. We were dead. We were dead to the things of God. We were zombies. If God were to wait for us to choose him, to love him, uh, he'd be waiting a long time. Because we're spiritually dead. We can never turn to him. We can never love him. We can never choose him. God's love is not conditional. It is unconditional. It's not conditional on anything we could do or who we could be. It is God who saw many worth to love us. So we're looking at characteristics of God's love. The first is the source is God. Secondly, it's unconditional. And thirdly, it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. God tells us that not only um, is his love great and infinite, it's unconditional, but it's sacrificial. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave his only son. How does he love you? He loves you in this way, that he gave his only son to you, for you. This, this is not an expression of a, of a feeling of love. His love took action. His love caused him to send that which was most precious to him, the most precious thing in the universe, and send it to, to die in your place. This is selfless, self-sacrificing love. He gave the gift of his son. His only son, his only one-of-a-kind son, the object of his love, his great love that he's known from all of eternity. And at Calvary, his son, whom he loved, became sin, unrecognizable to a father. He absorbed all the divine wrath that was stored up for you and I. And when he gave his son, he gave himself. the greatest gift someone could give you is themselves. In a counseling situation, a married couple were having difficulties and there was hardness and bitterness, lack of understanding, and the husband was just tired of hearing uh, his wife going on. So he said, I've given you everything. I've given you a new home, a uh, new, new clothes, a, a new car. I've given you, and he just kept on listing the things that he gave. And when he had ended, the wife partly said, that's true. You've given me everything except yourself. It's the greatest gift we can give. Many love like this person who talking to his fiance, I love you so much. I'd crawl across the Sahara Desert without any water for you. I'd fight, a, a, a fend, fight off a, a pride of lions for you. Th th there's nothing I wouldn't do because I love you. And if it doesn't rain tonight, I look forward to seeing you. That's our love. The greatest gift is giving oneself. And that's what God did with his son. 
John 10, 17, the reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up. The Father sent his Son to lay down his life. The giving of his Son he, is death. It's death on the cross. That, it wasn't just a, a time to spend with Jesus. He, he, he gave his Son to die. How do you, how do you think this plan was hatched? I've got a bunch of people... Uh, they're enemies, they deserve death, they're in rebellion against us, and I want you to go die in their place. Uh, who, who would sign up for that deal? Who, who, who of you who's a parent would ever send your own child to die for someone else? Never mind someone who hates you. Someone who's in rebellion against you. Someone who curses you. Someone who in their every fiber rebels against everything that you are. You're going to send your son to die for that person. That is what God did for us. Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Many of us don't love because of the cost. We fear rejection. We don't want to be hurt, so we have this, we protect ourselves. We don't want the pain, uh, the uh, emotional uh, burden that could come with it. So we don't love. But Jesus overcame all of that. God, the Father, w was willing to be separated from his Son, whom he loved, again, from all of eternity. The, the Son was willing to be separated from the Father and become a repository of sin in our place. Who was hurt? Who was in pain? Who was rejected? Jesus. He's the one who who was on the cross, who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For you. That's a sacrifice he made for you. And from that we see this great love that God has. On the cross, we, because he died on the cross, we know that the depth of our sin, but it also shows the depth and the, the greatness of God's love because he's willing to die for us. And fourthly, fourth characteristic is that it's a saving love. It's a saving love. For God, in this way, loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. So people overall are ignorant about the spiritual reality in which they live. We are perishing in our sins. We are born perishing in our sins. To perish doesn't, it means eternal judgment. It doesn't mean annihilation. It means that we're always dying and never dying. That's what it means to perish. And if people had spiritual glasses on, they'd see what Jonathan Edwards preached about. Where he said, oh sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It's a great furnace of wrath, wide and bottomless pit, full of fire and wrath, that you are held over in the hand of God, whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against uh, the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about and ready at every moment to singe it and burn it asunder. We are born dangling over a bottomless pit, a furnace of God's wrath, by a single thread of a spider web. Imagine that. A spider web, single, single thread, 
we are dangling over a bottomless pit. That is the reality in which everyone is born. But he says here, again, we have to look at the context to understand this. And right after this, so you have John 3.16. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of his only Son. And a few verses later in 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So here's the condition, that we are born in a condition where we are perishing. We are already condemned. Condemned is a legal term. This means that we have been already found guilty. And in this particular case, we are also not only found guilty, but we're also, in a sense, judged. And this is the case for everyone who's born. This is, this is who we are. And John describes his rescue plan for the perishing. He sent his son. He gave his son, as we talked about, to whom? It's described as whosoever. What does that mean? The Greek, as you may recall there, really it's not whomsoever. It's the, the words that are used in, in Greek are patho pistoon. Path means all. Po is the. And pistoon is a participle for believe, which is believing. All the believing ones. So he sent his, his son that all the believing ones in him will not perish. For in this way, God loved the world that he gave his one and only son that all who are believing in him will not perish. This is not an invitation to believe. This is a declaration of how God loves people. And the all are the, the, is describing the, the group, the, the believing ones. So here's this faith, this belief in, in God, which in Christ, which enables people to be saved, that they will not perish. And again, look at the immediate context here. It says in John 3, 15, look at 14, that Moses lifted the serpent in the, in the wilderness, so th must the Son of God, man, be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. That's the exact wording that's used in 3.16, whoever believes in him. It's also used in a, in a verse that we looked at last week in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who believes, present tense, believing in Christ has been, past participle, past perfect, has been born of God. Those who've been regenerate believe in God. And again, this is not a result of a decision to believe. This is, again, a work of God's relentless love. In Acts 13, 48, it describes who are the believing ones. It says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. As many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. This is, again, God's sovereign love working in the life of believers. It's not because of something that we did that we could choose him. He chose us. And because of that, we don't perish. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, now, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation now. When you believe. One pastor put it this way, God saved you for himself, he saved you by himself, and God saved you from himself. Not a single offense, no matter how great or how small, can be charged against you. Your record is clean. That's what it means, that you will not perish. God gave his son 
to die in your place. And when you believe in the saving work of Jesus Christ, you are no longer under God's wrath. You are reconciled. You are reconciled. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This peace is not a feeling. It's an objective reality. It means that two hostile parties are now at peace with another where they experience harmony and unity. So God's saving love, this rescuing love, at the cost of his son, brings you peace. Have you experienced that rescue? Have you experienced that peace? Have you experienced that saving love? How do you know? Well, Tim Keller has commented on this aspect of, of faith. And he says, when you see your sin, does it drive you further or closer to God? When you sin, say, I can't believe I'm a Christian. I, 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 I can't believe I did that. And does it cause you, when you sin in this way, to not want to be around other believers? Uh, when you're in habitual sin, does it cause you to not want to be close to God? Do you feel further from God? You may intellectually believe in the cross, but it drives you away. Well, if you understood this, you would understand that it would drive you closer to God. It would drive you to the foot of the cross. Because the more you see your sin, the more you see the truth about God's love for you. That he loves you in the midst of your sin. Knowing fully well your sin, more than you could ever know your sin. And he still loves you. His mercy, his grace is more precious than you could ever imagine. And that is what you think about. You rely on Jesus' work, his record, his righteousness, his atonement. When your voice says that you have no business being a Christian, you have no business saying that you're a Christian, you have no business being around Christians, Jesus is the voice that says, come, come to me. I took the blame. It is finished. Come close. I love you. That's the voice of God. That's what saving faith, that's what saving love looks like. And lastly, it's eternal love. So the source of love is God. It's unconditional love. It's sacrificial love. It's saving love. But it's also eternal love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. You will have eternal life. Which means that God's love will never end. It is never ceasing. You will have eternal life because God Christ died in your place and has given you life. John eleven twenty five. 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. For everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And because we never die, we will always experience God's love. His never-ending love. A love that knows no end. It's from everlasting to everlasting. And it's have eternal life. It's present tense. It's not will at some point have a eternal life. And it doesn't just mean that you're going to exist forever. Everyone exists forever. Unbelievers exist forever. They are immortal, just as believers are immortal. It's just where are you going to spend eternity? And for a believer, it's in the bosom of our Lord, experiencing his unending, unceasing love. It's a love that will never get withdrawn from you. 
You see, our love is fickle. Uh, man's love is temporal. Man's love diminishes. Love, man's love fades. But not God's. It is from everlasting to everlasting. And there's no requirement. There's no standard that you have to try to live up to to receive that love. It, it, it doesn't depart from you. It doesn't diminish in your life, in the midst of your sin. It doesn't go away. It isn't lessened by whatever you do. It is always there. It is never ending. It is unceasing. We think about Romans. Paul says in Romans 8, 37 to 39. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from his love. And what this verse is, John 3, 16, it's a promise of eternal security for all who believe in the Son. Frederick Lehman wrote this hymn. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we walk with ink of ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock of earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole through a stretch from sky to sky. Oh, love God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your great love. And we're so grateful that the source of our love is an infinite God who is all-powerful, but it cannot be weakened by our lovelessness or inability to love, but it is dependent on you who is all-powerful and, and loves to the end. We're grateful that it's unconditional, that there's nothing that we could do to earn it, but that you have sovereignly put your love on us, demonstrate your love sacrificially by giving your only one son, one of a kind son to die in our place. And we're so grateful that it's a, it's a saving love. It's a rescuing love. It delivers us from, from perishing. And it's an eternal love, a love that never ends, a love where we can never be separated out of your hands. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it by the stone. And when before the throne I stand, 
Well, it was wonderful worshiping with all of you, and if there's someone who has not put their faith and trust in, in Christ, who has not uh, believed um, that he was sent uh, by the Father um, for you, then we'd love to talk to you more. We'd love to share the gospel with you so that you could have that eternal life. Uh, and so please reach out to me or uh, someone uh, next to you, and we'll be happy to uh, share the gospel with you. Uh, we also, just uh, as you know, we have pictures today, so if you would like pictures taken with your family, then just stay in the sanctuary, and uh, we will be taking pictures uh, very shortly. And also, we have a fellowship lunch, and you're all welcome to attend, and whether you're a, a visitor or not, we, we have plenty of food, and we'd love for you to attend, so let me, let me pray for our lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your truth, and Lord, I pray if there's someone here who has, not, um, who has not turned to you, that today would be the day of their salvation. Today the day would be the day that you invade them with your amazing grace and relentless love so that they um, just uh, submit to the truth of who you are and who your son is and that they can have eternal life. And Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us and uh, the abundance you provide for us. We thank you that we could gather together for a meal and have fellowship together. We pray that you would bless our time together, that you would use all of us to bless and encourage one another, and thank you for the food that we're about to eat. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Thank you. You are loved.